background for me is, you can see Santa Monica Bay there in the background. I worked as a marine biologist for 32 years at two different sanitation agencies. And it was actually doing boat work in the San Monica Bay that got me to thinking about the land side. Basically, as a biologist, I, we were dealing with the ecology of um, benthic communities and fish communities out on the ocean. And I understood that the more diversity you have, the more healthy the community is. So um, when we would steam out of Marina del Rey and turn right, and go up past Venice and then Santa Monica, all of a sudden we could see hills with green and plants and it was rather nice. There were still communities around Marina, um, Malibu, and further up the uh, coastal communities up to Point Doom. But if we came out of Marina del Rey and turned left and went down coast, all there was was white, it was all development. And this got me interested and I also would jog, I live here in Redondo Beach and I would jog along the beach and thinking, all there is is ice plant, which I understood was not a native species, it's from South Africa, that we could put in native plants and increase the diversity of native plants and benefit the community. So that kind of started me down this, this road um, in 19... Or excuse me, 2006, I retired from the city of Los Angeles and picked up a job with the Palos Verde Peninsula Land Conservancy. And there I learned, really learned about the habitat and uh, became, developed a, um, I acquired the permit for surveying both the Palos Verde blue butterfly and the El Segundo blue butterfly. And both of those are endangered species. It's very easy to see the El Segundo blue butterfly. It's a lot more of a challenge to see the um, Palos Verde blue butterfly. Um, if you want to know academic background, I have two degrees from Cal State Long Beach, a Bachelor of Science in Marine Biology and a Master of Science in Biology. Um, I worked in all aspects of the lab, supervised a microbiology crew, concurrently with the boat crew and the marine biologist. That was interesting. Um, I've done a number of things. I've had a lot of fun with that. But today we want to focus on the El Segundo blue butterfly. And I'm going to talk until it flips to the next one. This right here, what's being shown, is an adopt a plot. And you'll see more about it later because it's close to my heart. I'm the um, external manager of it. I coordinate with um, one of the employees of the Palos Verde blue butterfly, a Palos Verde Peninsula. Land Conservancy, which I'll refer to as the Conservancy. Um, this is an area that I thought would be good for restoring because when I was doing surveys, I'd have to walk down to the bottom of the cliff, past the signs that says, don't go there, don't go there. And I, frankly, I didn't care for that. I thought, well, if we put in habitat here, I don't have to hike to the bottom. And it took me to fully retire from the working world to get this project off the ground. So here, I'm going to let this go for a few minutes and see if you can spot the El Segundo Blues in this video. And it will um, wrap around a couple times. So I'll give you a minute. Does anybody see any little flits of blue? OK, I can't look it's in not the darker moving. areas. Look in the darker areas, about the center, a little bit center left of your screen. I thought I did, but it ended up being a flag. <laughs> um, my screen isn't moving. Is there a video or is it? It's a video. Um, it's not moving too much because there were, the butterflies were flying all over the place. So, yeah, it's you know, for me, I've been looking at butterflies for over a decade, so I see them. But let's move on to the actual one where you can see pictures of the butterflies. So I'm calling this the Butterfly Walk, the quarantine edition of 2020. And this is one of the very first El Segundo blue butterflies that I, um, the picture that I, I took. It's, um, I think it was the very first butterfly. 
that was in 2007, where we learned that the Elsa Gunda blue butterflies colonized the Redondo Beach restoration site that was planted in 2004, and we learned about this in 2007. The guy who was the expert said they could not fly from where they were at that time to find this place. And well, they did anyway. So it's, it's, it was a real fun discovery. Okay. Um, so here's a close up picture of uh, this is an El Segundo female that I actually took um, last week. Um, it is endangered. It was the very first insect listed under the Endangered Species Act way back in 1976. And it had just been prior, the prior year, officially described as a unique species, as a subspecies. Um, and what's unusual about it, or not so with um, the blues, they tend to get fixated on one plant. And the mama Elsa going to blue butterfly will only lay her eggs on the sea cliff wild buckwheat. And there's mm. a picture on the right of your screen of a plant that is on a cliff. And it, I don't know how it grew there, but it was a really spectacular plant. I liked it. But every time you see images with little pup balls of white, that is the host plant. Uh, all my pictures are from local habitat. So what are the characters or characteristics of an El Segundo blue? As a member of the square spot family, you can see in both of these images, I put up two because they, each one looks a little different. The one on the left is freshly emerged and has real sharp features. The one on the right has been out for a while and is starting to get a little um, degraded in, it, in its look. You can see on the forewing, where the arrows are pointed, there is kind of a squarish grouping of the spots. But take a closer look, especially the top ones, the spots are square. That's why it's called a square spot. Um, you might see to the left, on, on your right, that right image, there's a small bug to the left of behind the butterfly. Mm -hmm. And they are often, you see them on the flower heads, usually after you take the picture and bring it home. Um, also, the, that particular butterfly is nectaring. Can you see um, her proboscis reaching down into the flower? It's doing that. And this is the best picture I have for it. Most of the pictures I have in this presentation were taken in the last couple of weeks, but not all. So where you do see the difference in males and females is when they have their wings open, but they don't do it very often. It's tough. I like to go in the morning around 1030 when they're still cool and the butterflies come out and they hold the wings open, trying to get warmed up before they start flying for the day. The one on the left is the female. They have chocolatey brown back wings. But if you look closely around her body, which I tend to think of as the fuselage, um, you can see a shade of blue. And when they're flying, you can see that blue pop out, but it's generally darker. The males are on the, um, shown on the right here. You can see more of, I like to think fur, but it's actually um, hairs more like cedar that I would see in marine crustacea. Uh, when they fly, it's a real bright blue. And I think we'll have more, we have more examples coming for you of videos. I do confess I'm not a experienced videographer. I can't be called a videographer. Um, certainly not ever going to be up for any kind of an award, but they should do the, the, um, the work. So here we have a female just doing what butterflies do in, in the wild. And I, I got in close which degraded the sharpness, but you can see she's just hanging around. You can see her brown wings and also the hairs on her body. You can see the orange looks a little bit more yellow, the orange in the back of the wing. And she's just rummaging around, probably drinking. You see the male flip through. Uh, that happens a lot. And they tend to open their wings wide whenever another butterfly over, flies over them. So she was sitting there and whoops, 
there she goes. That is classic butterfly behavior. But there are other blue butterflies. So um, be aware. If you see something that looks like this picture here in the left hand corner, it may or may not be an El Segundo Blue. An El Segundo Blue is flies around 4th of July and is hanging around the um, sea cliff buckwheat. This is an Ackman Blue, and I can tell a difference. It's a little bit larger. It takes a while to get a feel for their size. But the wing, the underwing, you know, with the wings up and all the spots, they're not as squarish on the El Segundo Blue. And you can see it's a very even light coat of gray, where the, the El Segundo Blues have um, a lot of hairs on their underwings, and it shades into kind of a, a darker gray, blackish color. Uh, this one, the gray hair streak is bigger, and the wings are very, very triangular, almost isosceles triangular. And they co-occur with El Segundo Blues. They'll lay their eggs on the sea cliff buckwheat. They'll lay lay their eggs elsewhere. You can see that this gray hair streak is sitting on the top of a developing inflorescence, uh, a flower stalk of uh, sea cliff buckwheat. And it was really behaving well for me that day. The marine blue, I've seen it fly year round on warm days. Um, and the, the back little spots on the edge of his hind wing are metallic in color. And the the brown waves is what I've been told is the name for its common name. But when it flies, you'll see a flash of blue. Um, and you'll it's about the same size as an El Segundo blue. So you can get it confused with any kind of a blue. Um, here's the pygmy blue. And I kind of like them. They're really cute. The best place to find them is on the salt bush in the parking lot at the uh, White Point Nature Preserve. Um, the one on the left is a female. And if you look carefully underneath her, there's some strings underneath the branch she's standing on. She was actually laying eggs. Um, it's the smallest, this is the smallest butterfly in North America. Um, and it's very tiny. So I say the El Segundo Blue is the size of your thumbnail. The Pygmy Blue is the size of your pinky fingernail. And I, I gave a picture of a female. It shows the, uh, the blue of their upper wings. And then the granddaddy of them all, everybody around here knows about the Palisbury blue butterfly. The one on top is a female. I took a picture of this during a uh, re release of captive reared individuals. Uh, there's been a lot of time and effort spent on this butterfly, and it's been a real puffin to get going. They released more this year than they have in years. And the Conservancy, the Palos Verde Peninsula Land Conservancy, has really got developing the habitat wired in. So I'm hopeful that eventually you all will be able to go out. Um, the best time to see them is about the third week of March. So maybe think of Easter and relate it to holidays. The fellow on the bottom, it shows their vivid blue butterflies. I took this with a really cheap cell phone camera. Um, he had he was a captive reared release. At the place where they're rearing them is out in Moore Park, and he had escaped the first level of protection or captivity, and was working on escaping out into the wild. So they felt he tried so hard that they packaged him up to take down to be released. He was very active. They actually named him Houdini. He, they usually don't name their butterflies, but this was this is Houdini. And when she he was released, the um, Jana Johnson, the um, professor who managed, manages the program, said, okay, Houdini, do your stuff. And apparently he had exhausted all his reserves and he just sat on this flower. Um, for the rest of the day and everybody got pictures of Houdini. So he's famous. Now you all know Houdini. Um, there's other wildlife that you'll find when you're looking at these butterflies. This is a Sonoran butterfly, a uh, Sonoran bumblebee. They have to love the um, po poppies and you'll notice that our coastal poppies have a lot of yellow to them. 
and I took a little video of them and they plop into the cup of the butter of the poppy. And they're just a whole lot of fun to watch. I was getting a little bit better with the video here. And here's another bumblebee that is a little bit more widespread than the Sonoran. Sonoran tends to be found by the coast, but this is a yellow-faced bumblebee and I've had it in my yard. Yeah, it's a half mile from the coast. Um, I have native plants in my yard. I'm um, fine painted ladies. I think you all heard about them last year when there was that massive migration. Um, mud daubers, they really love the sea cliff buckwheat. Uh, they're all over, they're out now. Um, they're, there's a small sting risk to them, but you have to really be nasty to the mud dauber for them to sting you. Um, they're carnivores and they eat critters nestled on these teeny tiny flowers. Um, this is the California towhee. They're often seen around habitat areas. They move around on the ground, but they'll also fly up into the shrubs. And uh, this one, I took a picture Tuesday at the Point City Interpretive Center. I was just walking around on the ground and I said, okay, I'm taking your picture there. Um, skippers, there's a lot of variety in the skippers. They're coming out now. They really get abundant in August. I do not try and determine what species they are. It's just beyond my ability to, to do that unless I actually sit down and work on it. And I guess these days I'm too lazy or too involved in other things. Tunnel spiders are fun and you'll see them out there. You'll first notice the bunch of webbing. But take a close look and you can see the tunnel spider. They're really cute. So now for the life history, of the El Segundo Blue. When I first learned about this, that this is a single brood butterfly, same with the Palos Verde Blue, I thought, what kind of lifestyle is that? But it is successful. So we'll start off with the adults. You can see right here, this is an X-rated picture, but it's a good one. They're, um, they're mating right now, they're copulating. And you, the butterflies need 30 to 60 minutes for it to be successful. So one of the easier pictures to take is of the butterflies mating. So they will mate and two, three days later, mama butterfly will lay herself an egg. Um, very tiny, very small. Um, and in three, oh, she'll lay about 15 to 20 eggs a day. Um, and she'll live as long until somebody eats her or she poops out. Um, she'll live up to a week. They live about two to seven days. Um, her, the caterpillar or larva, as the entomologist will say, will come out and the larval stage lasts from 18 to 25 days. What they do is they eat like any caterpillar around the world. They're eating machines. Um, they're so small when they first start. I've only seen the fourth and the fifth stages. They molt four times as a larva. And what they do is they eat meat, meat till they can't take any more. And then they molt. And you all know they molt by their back and then they grow real quick and then they eat meat, meat. So after they're really, really stuffed, they know it's time. And what they do as they crawl down to the leaf litter, the bottom of the plant, and they um, enclose into the pupal stage or the chrysalis. And they stay in the leaf litter. And this is what's blew me away. For our El Segundo Blues, they stay in the leaf litter through fall, winter, and spring, only to come out in the summer. So the butterflies that are flying right now were born last year and they made it through the larval stages, they made it through the pupil stage, and now they're out flying. Uh, it just how in the world is that successful? Many butterflies have multiple broods throughout the year, including uh, blues like the marine blue and acne blue. So here are a couple butterflies and um, 
guys, if you think you have difficult with the women, be glad you're not a butterfly because when they're mating, the females continue to exude pheromones. Uh, butterflies are sensitive to smell and probably smells we can't smell. And the female continues to exude pheromones while she's mating and that brings in other males. So the one, the picture on the screen, um, I've been watching this pair for quite some time, snapping as many pictures as I could. And this was the final attack where the hero, the male right here, thwarted the interloper. And on this picture, it's definitely flying away and I didn't see it come back. So he was successful and the female just sat there she did not open her wings. Sometimes they will, if the attack is very aggressive. So I've got um, a video here and keep your eyes on this area, but you saw a male just fly through. He knows something's up. He's smelling those pheromones. And uh, I eventually there's, there, there's again, another one. And to the right, there's another butterfly. I think it was just warming up. So I zoomed in even though I knew it'd be not as well focused. Uh, but you can see all kinds of bugs that are flying around. They're very small step. There goes the interloper and you see both butterflies open up. Went fast, didn't it? Uh. Okay, here we go. We continue on. So once the female is gravid, meaning she has eggs, she's been fertilized and, and now is ready to lay, lay them, she picks the plant that she wants to use. It's only going to be the sea cliff buckwheat. Um, and here on the left is a picture of her, the abdomen. She deflects it down. Usually it's straight, kind of like a fuselage on a plane. But when she's ready to lay eggs, she'll bend her abdomen down into the flower and deposit an egg. And I've watched her deposit more than one egg on a flower head. Now each larva that is out and about needs two to three flower heads to you know, chow down in order to grow. On the right over here, you can see a picture of a larva. Um, this one's pink. You can see the flower there is pink. Um, sometimes there's a lot of green. They eat a lot of green and the, the spots on them are green. So here is a video of a butterfly laying an egg that I took. And you'll see her abdomen. Look closely. There it is. There it is. There it is again. And it was a windy day. Generally, when they're actually laying the egg, they open their wings up. Now she's just poking around trying to decide if there's something else there. They, they, they can be picky. Oh, yeah, we had an earthquake right there. Sorry about that. And see that wing moving? This is why I kept that. Um, a lot of these blues will rub their wings like that and you they'll wear out their wings they can still fly but the scales kind of get i don't think they get scraped off they just get worn out And the noise is from the ocean. That spot is right above the water. Okay. So life is not always easy for the butterfly. Um, they have issues with parasites, notably the larvae. So on the left-hand side of the screen, um, I think I used the same picture, maybe a different one. Um, is parasitized by a wasp in particular. And um, I'm not too sure what parts this is. It reminds me of a copepod parasite. So that's a marine um, crustacean. But 
the um, one of the experts, entomologists that I work with, he was quite delighted to see that I actually caught a picture of a parasite. So that's a problem if the parasites become too, if it becomes, the larvae becomes too heavily infested, that will affect its viability. Birds, especially bug eating birds, um, present a threat. So I have this cactus wren. Uh, picture and the butterflies are out while cactus wrens are feeding their young. So I would not be surprised if cactus wrens found them. Um, I think one of their bigger threats is lizards because lizards will climb into the buckwheat and just wait. And when they see a butterfly, they, they jump out. So I have not caught any of the butterfly jumping out and catching them. Although I've seen a female butterfly evade being bitten and eaten and i saw a butterfly last summer get eaten by a lizard so i have a video here so see the yellow this is a um, side blotched lizard and he's looking around to find a decent bush to climb in in fact whenever you start seeing the lizards move you know the butterflies are going to be flying next so here he goes Or she goes off to go find some butterflies. Okay. Other threats include for, of the Elsa Gunda blues. The worst one is can anybody have any idea what the worst one would be? Think about it for a moment. Then I'll flip the screen. Loss of habitat. And this is the concept that got me involved in all of this. Um, I really like Google Earth and I've outlined in this different areas that have the potential for harboring the El Segundo blue butterfly. But you can see most of it has been paved over. Um, there's the Bologna wetlands and there's now butterflies in the wetlands. Um, Along here in front of Dockweiler Beach, there's butterflies and there's places in El Segundo. But you can see places with green here. And look at, this is the Hermosa Valley area. Um, these little spots of yellow, we already have butterflies. Um, and then all along these cliffs of Pelsbury States, all the way out to the end is um, at Point Vicente, we have butterflies. There's Post plant all through there. I was talking with a fellow who spent a lot of time with these butterflies back in the 70s. He's up north now in the San Francisco area. And I asked him, did you climb all the cliffs around Palos Verdes? And he goes, uh, no. And I said, yeah, I understand. I am not willing to do that either. But we've got butterflies in the area, um, but they're all along the coast. Okay, what's going on? So I want to give some context to you guys. Often I usually start my butterfly talk with this, so I've got it mixed up a little bit. Um, the Mediterranean climate really is why this butterfly is in danger, and bear with me. The Mediterranean climate is quite special. Um, it occurs in very few areas of the world, and it's ordered along latitudes and i can't remember what it is like 32 to 34 degrees um, north or south and we have five areas in the world we have california um, chile and of course the mediterranean area is the largest area south africa and south america uh, south southern southwestern part of australia in, in two areas um, and what what's the driver of this is the currents in the Pacific Ocean, they come around and it goes up the coast by Japan and um, Russia. And then starting from the Gulf of Alaska, California current comes down. You can imagine coming out of the um, Northern Arctic areas, it's cold water. As you all know, when you go swimming in the summertime here, the water's cool. 
If you go to the East Coast, the water's warm because you have the Gulf Stream. So in the northern things, the currents are clockwise. And of course, in the southern hemisphere, they're counterclockwise. So all of these are on the west coast of the continents where they're getting cold water coming along continental plate, places, land masses that are warm. And so what happens is like taking a hot shower in a cold bathroom, you get steam. Hence, we have our marine overcast and our fogs frequently, especially in this time of year. And we're just starting coming out of the June gloom area. Um, this is important because the plants that are adapted to this climate obtain 50% of their water needs through the moist air of our fogs and overcast. So we're different. We have mild rainy winters and warm dry summers with fogs and overcast. Most climate zones in the world have uh, most of their rain occurring in the summertime. Now, growing up in Southern California, I couldn't believe other people had rain in the summertime. I thought, how would you ruin a summer with rain? Uh, so the climate, um, because this is a different type of climate, it drives the diversity and the uniqueness. Because something that wants warm or wet summers is not going to do well in our climate zone. So the Mediterranean climate, here's some stats for you. Um, we have wet winters, dry summers, I've mentioned that. Our climate zone only covers two and a quarter of the Earth's land. Um, I don't know, I, I think the image on the upper left-hand corner, yeah, it's, it's a cartoon. Um, what's interesting, in such a small percentage of the land, it contains 16% of the world's plant species. And then, of course, there's associated fauna with it, and that everything is adapted to this climate. California, in particular, contains, has 33% of the United States plant species, and yet covers only 3% of the entire US landmass. So we have this highly, highly diverse area. And all of these are adapted to the dry summer using a variety of strategies. Um, I can talk at length about that, but uh, we can do that in the Q&A. Because we have such great diversity um, and we've had so much development, we're considered a biodiversity hotspot. And it's defined as a half percent or 1,500 endemic plant species uh, with a 70% loss of habitat. Now, endism is a plant that occurs here, nowhere, nowhere else. So the Elsagunda blue butterfly occurs here in this area. The sea cliff buckwheat goes along the coast from about, um, let's see, Morro Bay down to, I don't know if it goes into Mexico. I don't think so. Uh, really peters out as you approach um, San Diego. So it's a unique habitat. The picture here if you're left is Torrance, and that's the area that I consider is the best habitat. It's about 33% buckwheat, so you can see all the buckwheat plants there. And it's about 33% of uh, California bush sunflower. There's other areas with about 33% um, uh, California sagebrush, and then the rest is just diverse plants. Uh, you definitely get more butterflies when you have a situation like this than if you have some buckwheats and a whole bunch of ice plants. So the butterflies really want a nice habitat, and there it is. So what really is the problem here? Everybody loves this climate, and there's been so much urbanization here and we have such a large population that um, we need to be creative on how we're going to do it because we really can help the butterfly and all the animals associated with it. And I'll, I'll do a little bit of advertisement. Um, you'll see a picture in my yard later. Um, last year, last summer, we had 
um, from dark-eyed juncos, which is uh, a species I associate with coniferous forests. And they showed up in the winter time. I didn't think they'd hang around. Well, they did hang around because I have all this habitat in my yard. Um, I've got a lot of food with them. And they raised three broods, or no, two broods last year. They were young. This year, they're on their fourth brood. Mama Junko is sitting on her fourth brood. They've built a total of three nests and one pot hanging on the garage wall. Um, they're happy. Um, so we can do a lot in a lot of different ways. I'm leaving the picture up on the left-hand corner. I took that um, Tuesday this week. Um, these are special group because they work on my adopter plot. And we are working on adding habitat to a small plot of land um, for the Palsbridi um, Peninsula Land Conservancy, the Conservancy. There's a lot you can do. You don't have to go out there and water during drought years and weed during heavy winter years. You can volunteer in other ways, in an office or for the conservancy in the nursery that is like a place of zen. You can provide financial contributes, contributions. Um, there's a lot of ways you can do it. You can plant natives in your garden. And this is, this is my yard. Uh, the birds are on the north side of the, the garage there. But this is uh, the one place where I have it kind of designed. Most of my plants uh, look like natural habitat. Oh, how did she get there again? This is the crew. Um, and in fact, Cynthia is here. Oops. And Julian is here. No, no, this is Nina, Nina, Julian, and Julian's wife, and Cynthia. Uh, they've been with me for four years of this. And so this is where we started the very first day. About 80 to 90 plants were planted. The Conservancy's field crews help, and we take care of all the watering and the planting. They just dig the holes. Well, they plant. They can plant faster than you would know. They can put in 100 plants in about an hour. They're amazing, guys. Um, this is 2017-18, the next year. Now, it was a tough year because we didn't get much rain, and I didn't wake up to that fact till about halfway through January, so then we started watering like crazy. Uh, many of these plants survived just fine. You can see there's some plants there, but they're not very big. There's a ditty. When you plant a native plant, the first year it sleeps because what it's doing is developing its root structure. It needs that root structure to survive the summer drought period. Then the second year they creep. So these plants are busy creeping, but we added more plants that are just sleeping. So here would be our creeping plants and here's our sleeping plants. And then the third year they start to explode. But it takes about seven years for it to get looking like what the uh, Torrance Beach area looks like. And then this past year, I changed my photographs to look with my back to the sun so you can see things better and I can take a better picture. This is what it's looking like now. You see a lot of bare areas and we had a real problem with weeds but um, the plants are really looking good. And when we were there Tuesday, it was my annual end of season celebration. I buy lunch for everybody. Um, they all wanted to look at our plot because it's looking so much better. In a um, few more years, it's gonna look really cool. Um, and the, the, the other thing, yeah, I said grow natives. Um, this is the end of the formal slide here. And I can put the, um, the video on again. This is a website that's not been formally released, but it's the ESB Coalition. Um, I put in my critiques, and that may have been part of the delay in it getting formally released. But this is meant to be a one-stop place with lots of references. And it's going to be a work in progress for some time. 